All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Red Cedar Hall. On behalf of the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe, thanks for coming out. My name is David Brownell. I'm the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer uh, for the Jamestown Sklalem Tribe. This is a presentation that I actually gave back in May over in Port Townsend at the Maritime Center there. Um, but it's pretty much the same presentation I gave there, made a few modifications when people told me I was wrong about a few things. Um, so this should be a little bit more correct. Uh, so before I get started, just a couple quick announcements. If you're interested in learning more about uh, Jamestown Squalum history and culture, uh, I would definitely recommend checking out our Heron Hall Tribal Library, which is right across the street. Um, on the podium in front, you'll see there's a brochure that has information about the library. Um, we have a couple upcoming events. Um, Clallam County Reads, uh, October 15th at 5.15 p.m. The Soul of an Octopus, a surprising exploration into the wonder of consciousness. That actually sounds really cool. Um, so there's that. And then on October 30th at 6 p.m. right here in Red Cedar Hall, we're going to be showing a film called We the Voyagers, Lata's Children, um, with a special guest, Mimi George, who's actually the director of the film. Um, and then some of their canoe family will be here. So that's going to be a really cool event. Uh, we also have an online museum. There's these little flyers out on the um, front desk as well. These have a URL for our, house, our tribal museum.jamestowntribe.org that takes you to our House of Seven Generations online museum where you can see photos of artifacts, um, baskets. We also have lots of historic photos from tribal families in the tribe's history. Um, so I would recommend checking that out as well. Um, and then I'm talking today about Kitai, which was the Squalum Village at Port Townsend. Um, you may or may not be aware that we recently finished our Chichmahan Trail project. Um, Chichmahan or Chetsamoko was the um, famous Squalum chief at the time of treaty signing, who uh, his village was Kitai. Um, so out on the front podium are also Chichmahan Trail route maps. And there's 18 sites on that trail of uh, cultural and historic importance to the Squalum and Chemicum peoples. Um, and e each of those stops is a sign. That sign has some historic information. And then it also has a QR code that goes to a page on our online museum that has additional information and photos on it. So um, definitely a good thing to check out maybe when the weather's, weather's a little better than today. Um, all right. So to get started today, I'm going to be talking primarily about uh, the history of the village of Kitai, which is up here where Port Townsend is located today. Um, this map was created by anthropologist Josh Wisniewski, who now works for the Point No Point Treaty Council, doing a lot of anthropological research for the tribes. Uh, and what he did was go through a bunch of, do a ton of research and document the different village sites around Port Townsend Bay. Um, these were not all contemporaneous with each other. These villages were occupied at different periods in time. Um, we now know through archaeology, you know, there's additional village sites on this map, like at Crane Point, that weren't accounted historically, but we know from archaeology there was a village site sometime in the last thousand years at that location. Um, so Katai, the, the primary Squalum village on Port Townsend Bay, Tsitsibus, uh, was down here where Port Hadlock was, and that was a huge village for the Chimicum tribe. Um, and I'm going to talk about, a bit about them later. And then there was actually another Squalum village uh, before the Army Corps put in the Portage Canal between Indian Island and the Olympic Peninsula. There is actually a tumbelo, which is a sand spit that connects two larger bodies. And on the mil middle of that tumbelo, you can see the village there, and there's a Squalum village in that location. Um, and this village we know was occupied up until at least the 1828 when it was attacked by the Hudson Bay Company. Um, this sketch that I'll talk about a little bit later, this is from James Swan's notebooks, and this is a sketch he did of a potlatch in Chichmahan's longhouse at Katai in 1857, and that's his younger wife, Jenny Lind, uh, distributing potlatch gifts. Uh, so just to kind of give you a, a sort of brief timeline, um, and I apologize, I'm going to keep turning my head because I usually have my screen in front of me, and this time I don't I'll kind of switch around. Uh, around 1,400 years before present was when the last ice age ended in our area, and that ice sheet started to retreat back north. 
Uh, around 13,800 years before present was when the Manus Mastodon was butchered in Happy Valley, south of Squim. Um, there's additional components uh, on top of that Mastodon, basically butchered uh, caribou or reindeer and bison antiquus, which are um, American bison's larger ancestors. Um, so humans were occupying that site probably um, seasonally as a hunting camp on the edge of a pond, and that was repeatedly occupied up through um, at least uh, five and a half, six thousand 6,000 years ago because there was an occupation on top of the Mazama ash layer. Mount Mazama is where Crater Lake is in Oregon. That eruption happened roughly 6,000 years ago. And so we can find that ash layer all through the Pacific Northwest and get a, a age range for sites based off of that. So, <coughs> excuse me, this site was occupied before and after the Mazama uh, eruption. Uh, we have, I'm numbering, I have numbered these, so this is the, the Manus Mastodon site. <clears throat> this is a, actually a Camus cook pit from Eby's Landing over on Whidbey Island. Uh, and archaeological evidence puts that at least eight and a half thousand years before present, humans were occupying the prairies on Whidbey Island. Um, probably, again, seasonally hunting terrestrial mammals like deer, elk, that sort of thing. Uh, around 5,000 years ago, sea levels uh, rise to about two, within two or three meters of our um, current sea level. Uh, that's also when the forests close in, so we go from having a mostly open landscape and people go from hunting primary, primarily terrestrial mammals, cervids like black-tailed deer and elk. Um, the forests close in and that's when uh, most humans out in this area um, started actually going after marine mammals and salmon. So you see that cultural shift. Uh, the western red cedar also arrives, and so that's when you see a huge increase in woodworking uh, techniques and culture and development of those skills. Uh, 3,000 to 300 years before present is the range of radiocarbon dates of the hearths, hearths and camas ovens at uh, Eby's Landing over there directly across uh, Admiralty Inlet from Katai. Uh, 1,500 years before present is the earliest documented occupancy of Buggy Spit, which is a spit on the northeast corner of Indian Island uh, and was a, one of the village sites on that map. And then uh, Wayland Point is another point on the west side of Indian Island. Um, and we know from radiocarbon dates that site was occupied at least 750 years before present. Um, this photo is actually taken um, in springtime over at the Katai Prairie uh, Reserve in Port Townsend at the public golf course. If you don't know, there's a small, about one and a half acre patch of um, Pacific Northwest Rain Shadow Prairie that's been preserved there um, and maintained by the Friends of the Katai Prairie. Um, it's really beautiful. This time of year, it's gonna look like a bunch of brown grass. Uh, but if you go from, I'd say, May through June, there's beautiful blooms of our native bl blue camas, uh, the white death camas, the yellow is lomatium, which is our native celery that grows here, had a very big uh, spiritual importance for the tribes. Um, lots of really cool plant species still hanging out there. And these were, these prairies sort of dotted this whole landscape on our northeast corner of the Olympic Peninsula. Those prairies over on Whidbey Island and then up on San Juan Island and the southeast corner of uh, Vancouver Island, Victoria. Um, so. Manuel Quimper was the first European to arrive in this area, uh, and he sailed in as far as Discovery Bay. So what you see on this map is, um, this is Dungeness Bay up here. This is the entrance to Squim Bay, which they didn't enter. This cross he erected in the area of Gray's Marsh and claimed it for Spain. This is Protection Island, Discovery Bay. And then you can see they basically mapped out the entrance to Admiralty Inlet, but they never entered it. That's as far as they got. Uh, but what was really great is we have this awesome account from Quimper of uh, their time in Discovery Bay. They actually anchored there for a couple of days. Um, and he talks at length about the many canoes of Indians coming out with delicious and abundant fish and shellfish. Uh, he gave the chief some pieces of copper as a sign of friendship. They gave him, they traded some reed mats that would have been woven out of um, tule grass, which is still growing at the Katai Lagoon there in Port Townsend. Uh, 
They had um, woolen blankets, which were woven out of a combination of fireweed, and then the Sklalem and a couple other Coast Salish tribes had wool dogs. And they kept those wool dogs, it was a specific dog breed, and they were kept on islands, so they didn't intermix with sort of the mongrel mutt dogs that were in the villages. Um, they were different colors. There were white wool dogs, brown wool dogs, black wool dogs. They were small, fluffy things, kind of like the size of a Pomeranian. And every year the women would go and they would actually trim all of the wool off of those dogs. It wasn't hair, it was actually wool, like what you get off of a sheep. It wicks water, it keeps you warm even when it's wet. So they would uh, get the wool off of those dogs and they would create the, weave these amazing, beautiful blankets. Um, unfortunately, uh, as soon as Europeans arrived with trade goods and specifically European wool and sheep's wool, uh, they stopped maintaining those the individual breeds of dogs, they were allowed to mix with the other curs and mongrel dogs running around. And so that breed kind of disappeared. And there's actually people working on bringing that back today, um, which will be interesting to see how that, how that comes about. Um, skins of bear, buffalo, they called them buffalo because the elk were so big out here, the Spaniards couldn't believe that that was a species of deer. They thought it was a big buffalo um, and deer. At sunset, the canoes went away, having passed almost all day alongside with much noisy display of pleasure, evidenced by their singing and demonstrations. I love that line. Uh, George Vancouver came in in 1792. He also sailed into Discovery Bay. Interesting to note his totally different account of what he found. A deserted village capable of containing 100 inhabitants, now fallen into decay, amongst which were found several human skulls and other bones scattered about. This was not tradition to leave human remains laying about in a village. This village was hit by a, probably a smallpox epidemic or some other introduced disease. Um, and that happened all around Discovery Bay. And our different excursions, particularly those in the neighborhood of Port Discovery, which is what they called Discovery Bay, Skulls, limbs, ribs, and backbones, and other vestiges of the human body were found in many places scattered about the beach in great numbers. I was informed by the officers that uh, basically their theory was that there were so many remains uh, as to produce an idea that the environs of Port Discovery were a general cemetery for the whole surrounding country. They weren't. Every village on Discovery Bay had been wiped out by disease at that point, or just about. Um, there were a few families left. Uh, who their descendants are, are members of the Sklalem tribes today. Uh, Vancouver also sailed into Port Townsend Bay, found another deserted Indian village, much at the same state of decay as that at the head of Port Discovery. So, you know, going back to Quimper's account of the, you know, um, happy trading story, in that trading, you're not only trading the goods, you're trading diseases. And so that's what you're seeing the product of two years later when Vancouver sails in. Um, they also found at Wayland Point two upright poles stuck in the head with skulls set on top. This was territorial marking of um, basically village sites. Um, when another tribe would attack, you would beat them and then you would put their heads on sticks to warn off the next, next people coming through from getting the same ideas. Um, we have really great lithographs from Vancouver's account of his explorations and what they show us are the duck poles out on the spits. Um, this would be looking um, kind of north from Port Townsend towards Fort Warden. And then this is actually looking south from uh, what at the time was a spit, it's now Rat Island. Uh, and this is looking down Killisset Harbor, this is Indian Island, this is Maristone Island, and that's Mount Rainier in the distance. And there's another one of those duck poles. Um, each Squalum family would own a pair of duck poles that they would maintain year after year. And these would be anywhere from 40 to 90 feet tall. And they would maintain the poles, and then they would also have a very large net, usually you know, 90 feet wide by 40 or 50 feet tall, and that was woven out of nettle fibers. And they would go out there and dawn at dusk during our annual waterfowl migrations. You send somebody out on a canoe when, the, when you're in low light conditions, pull that net up between the poles, they scare the birds off the water, the birds fly over the spit, they get caught in the net, you drop it down, and you've got a couple hundred ducks that you can smoke and preserve the meat. Um, so we find a, a ton of duck bone at our archaeological sites out here. Getting into the early 19th century, uh, Frank Ermit, I can't even pronounce his last name, 
Uh, he was a member of the Hudson Bay Company party that was sent up on a punitive mission to attack the Squalum um, in retaliation for a Squalum killing of a Hudson Bay Company agent. Uh, they sent a, a ship up around from uh, the Columbia River, and then they sent an overland party of about 50 or 60 men, um, actually marched over from the Columbia River o overland up the Cowlitz, then through Olympia, up along Hood Canal. They met up with the ship. Uh, the first village they reached was this one on the, the Tumbelow, uh, at, on Oak Bay, just south of Indian Island. They attacked uh, two longhouses and killed two families, men, women, and children. Um, then they embarked over to the Dungeness villages here inside the Dungeness Fit Spit. Um, they began to negotiate for the return of the Indian agent's wife, or the Hudson Bay Company's agent's wife. Uh, negotiations broke down. The Cadboro, the, the Hudson Bay Company ship, shelled the village destroyed all the village, all of their canoes, the, the Squalum escaped, um, and that was when actually the Dungeness Squalum moved their village that was at the mouth of the Dungeness. Um, and that was the village of Statithlam. Statithlam is the ancestral chief from which the Jamestown Squalum um, descend. So that's basically his account of the attack on that lodge. In 1840, a Catholic missionary, Father Blanchette, um, he was kind of working out through this whole area um, and then kind of more north up towards Fort Langley, but he visited Whidbey Island. He stopped at a camp of Slalom on the west side of the island, probably around Eby's Landing, um, which is the only real fresh water source, that ravine that comes down there, so it made it an important campsite. Uh, it's very difficult to paddle through Admiralty Inlet on a canoe um, when you've got counter tides or a strong current. And so what you have at both North Beach on the Quimper Peninsula, northeast of Port Townsend, and then over at Eby's Landing on Whidbey Island were two campsites where uh, the tribes would pull off and camp out and wait for those currents to turn so that they could paddle through the inlet. Uh, so Father Blanchette visited a camp of Qualams there around Eby's Landing. He then crossed to the other side of the island, and in the middle of the forest, he came upon a potato field planted in rows much too close uh, so this is evidence of the, the Squalum, as, as we know through the radiocarbon dates, had been going over to Whidbey Island um, and processing and cooking camas in those uh, cook pits for at least the last 3,000 years. The Spaniards, when they landed at Nia Bay and established a small fort there, they brought potatoes with them. The native peoples of the Pacific Northwest caught on to the importance and the value of potatoes very quickly. And what's great about potatoes is you can grow them using basically the same traditions that the women used for managing their camas patches. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty easy form of agriculture to pick up and carry on. Uh, and so what you find before, you know, 15, 20 years before you even have white settlement out in this area, there's already potato patches around all of the tribe villages and campsites. Uh, unfortunately, once white settlement started, guess where the first white settlers stopped and built their houses was next to these nice potato patches that were in the middle of the forest for some magical reason and they had free potatoes. And then the tribe would show up in the fall to come harvest their potatoes and suddenly there was somebody living there and you had some confrontations that happened. Um, and that's kind of throughout the Pacific Northwest. That was a reoccurring theme. Uh, so in 1841, Captain Wilkes was part of the U.S. Exploring Expedition, uh, a government-funded um, survey of basically the Pacific Northwest. The government sent out a group to find out what's out there and describe it. Uh, and that's when we get our first series of relatively accurate maps of this area that actually show specific village sites like the one I was referring to earlier. This is a zoomed-in version of this much larger map. Uh, of interest, they don't show a village at Katai at that time. It was probably a seasonal encampment in 1841. Uh, we have very big herring um, migrations, that schools that come in seasonally into Port Townsend Bay. And so that's what we find uh, archaeologically in Katai when you get back into the pre-contact um, archaeology is uh, big layers of nothing but herring bone billions and billions of herring bones from people coming out and harvesting those herring annually. Um, so 
Captain Wilkes actually sailed into Discovery Bay. At that time, the number of residents in this bay was quite large. It had rebounded from those epidemics. I counted their canoes at the time of meals, and the numbers were, and yeah, he left the number blank, so we don't actually know how many people there were. Thanks, Captain. Uh, he also sailed down to Oak Bay, which is the site of that attack by the Hudson Bay Company uh, 13 years prior. Um, and he still found a lodge or two of Indians with three or four families and a patch of potatoes. Um, a little bit about the Chimicum. So I mentioned earlier Tsetsibis was a large Chimicum village down here by Port Hadlock. There was also a Chimicum village at the mouth of Chimicum Creek. Go figure. Um, the Chimicum, we have very um, vague and general descriptions of um, for a number of reasons. They were never a very large tribe, but they were a very warlike tribe. Um, they did not always get along with their neighbors. Um, there's various descriptions of that, and because they're all passed down mainly through the Chimicum's enemies, it's kind of hard to discern how much of it is truth or not. But the gist of it was the Chimicum occupied a very strategic location on Port Townsend Bay, controlling the entrance to Admiralty Inlet, and they used that location strategically to uh, alleviate canoes from other tribes of their goods as they were paddling through the strait. Some might call that piracy, some might call that um, fortuitous luck, you know, it didn't make for good neighbors. So what happens is we have, we have a couple different accounts that have different um, details, but all generally describe the same thing happening which is that at least once, possibly twice, um, between the 1830s and 1850s, the Chimicum were attacked by confederations of at least two, possibly three or four different tribes. Um, Elmendorf, who wrote Tawana Narratives, which is kind of the history of the Tawana, or they're known today as the Skokomish people, um, he attributes the attack to the Suquamish during a raid that occurred in 1850. Frank Tech was a um, uh, ethnographer and anthropologist who was actually interviewing a man named Bill Jarman, who was a white pioneer who lived out here. Um, and, and so Bill Jarman's uh, accounts are very embellished. So there's, you know, we have to kind of take it with a grain of salt. He says that the Chimicum had uh, fortifications or palisades of timbers all around the village. And this would match up with all of the other Coast Salish villages out here at that time. They were all palisaded. Um, the tribes around the Salish Sea at that time were getting raided by the Tlingit, Haida, Chimshian, and Alaskan tribes to the north. Those tribes had earlier contact with the Russians. They were impacted by a disease earlier than the tribes down here. Their populations declined, but they also had access to firearms from the Russians earlier. So what they did was pack canoes full of warriors with firearms and paddle down here to the Salish Sea, do slave raids, and then take those back north of their villages to repopulate. So by the 1830s, 1840s, all of the Coast Salish villages out here would have had defensible palisades around them. Um, according to Bill Jarman, it was the Skagits and Snohomish who combined to uh, uh, set fire to the palisades and killed a Chemicum um, almost to a man. Uh, when Bill moved with in with the Clallams in Port Townsend in the 1840s. The chief of the Chimicums, General Gaines, um, who's also accounted in different accounts as a Squalum chief, and he was probably related to both. Uh, by that time, there were uh, 200 Chimicums left, and I'll, I'll talk about by the 1860s, there were less than 100. Uh, and at that time, there were around 2,000 Squalum. Louise Butner Webster, the uh, Webster Butner family is a Pork Amble Slalom family today, and they're the descendants of Louise um, and her family, who, and she married Jim Webster, or Chimicum Jim, who was one of those last Chimicum. Um, they lived on Indian Island next door to the Prince family, who their descendants are now Jamestown Slalom. Uh, and they were the last native residents, along with the Prince of Wales, up until the 1930s when the Navy bought Indian Island. Uh, and that's a picture of her actually in the 1930s. Um, this was actually as part of a Seattle Times article. This was when they burned the old Point Julia village uh, on the spit at Port Gamble and forced the tribe to move up to new housing up the top and they were interviewing her um, at that time. 
1852 Indian agent report puts the um, number of squalum on the coast between Los Angeles and Port Townsend, Port Angeles, it literally says Los Angeles though, uh, 800 people, and then says there was around 75 Chimicum left around Port Townsend, and that's in 1852. According to the Indian agent at that time, the Squalum speak a distinct tongue. They wander around a great deal, but trade mostly at Victoria on Vancouver's Island. The establishment of the international border, uh, the signing of the treaty in 1855, and the federal government telling the Squalum they were no longer allowed to trade at their traditional village on Victoria had a huge impact on the Squalum tribes. The Chimicum speak a distinct language, and uh, Chimacuan is actually uh, a language isolate. So Chimicum, or Chimacuan, is related to the Quili language out on the west end of the Olympic Peninsula, and those two languages are not related to any other Native American languages in this continent. Um, so a bit of a mystery there. Um, there's some theories, but I'm not going to dive into those because linguistics are weird and people confuse linguistics with genetics and, and real history. So um, it, gets, it gets a bit hairy, but we do have really cool um, field notes. Erna Gunther was an ethnographer who worked out here in the 1920s interviewing um, Squalum elders about uh, Squalum traditional life in the 1880s and the villages of the 1880s. And I've been transcribing her field notes, and in those we actually find specific family genealogies for Jamestown Squalum families. And shockingly, if you go back three or four generations, a lot of them are part Chimicum, related to Chimicum families from Discovery Bay. So there was a lot of intermarriage there. There would have been a relationship between the two tribes. It wasn't always war and battle between the two. Um, and that goes far back into time. Uh, and that goes for, you know, uh, Port Gamble, Squalum, and, and uh, Tawana or Skokomish as well. They all have Chemicum descendants who number among their tribes today. Um, Myron Neals was the brother, he was a missionary, he was the brother of Edwin Eels, who was the Indian agent working out of the Skokomish agency at the time. In 1875, he talks about the Chemicum as having a village near Irondale or Port Hadlock called Setsibus, uh, said to have been the capital for nearly all the tribes on the Sound and where they occasionally, for various purposes, gathered. I'm missing a word. Um, and, and interpreting that statement, the tribes out here did not have a capital. Tsetsibis was a central location for potlatches, because you're right there on Admiralty Inlet. So it's, it's pretty accessible from tribes all around the Salish Sea, the tribes down along Hood Canal, the tribes down at the, the south end of Puget Sound. They would all come up to Tsetsibis and have these big potlatches there in Hadlock. Uh, Dr. Gibbs, who is, he's, he's referring to Dr. Gibbs, who is part of the um, treaty signing party in the 1850s. Uh, in 1852, stated their number to have been 90, but they are now virtually extinct. Again, this is 1875. Uh, there being none left who are not married to white men or into other tribes. The last complete families connected themselves with the Klallam Indians, but death has destroyed them as families, leaving only scattered individuals, and they use the Klallam language. So people say, what happened to the Chimicum? That's it. In the 1870s, they became, uh, or 1860s, they became what's called administratively extinct, which means that the federal government simply quit acknowledging them as an independent tribe, as a sovereign nation, and started numbering them amongst the Squalum on Indian agent reports and censuses and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's when, as a sociological unit, they simply didn't exist on paperwork anymore. Um, and from that point on, any sort of government services and that sort of thing were directed towards the Squalum people, regardless of whether they had Chemicum ancestry. Uh, so getting into the, the treaty era, um, I love this little snippet from 1854, the um, Pioneer and Democrat, which is one of our local newspapers out here, um, the Cowichan and Klallam Indians made a big row on the beach on Tuesday night, seriously disturbing the rest of several families. The Klallam killed five out of the 11 Cowichans. The Cowichans and Klallam have never really got along. The Cowichans live up kind of around the corner, the southeast corner of Vancouver Island. There's Cowichan Lake, um, if you're familiar at all with that area. Um, they had a very antagonistic relationship. They uh, raided each other a lot for slaves. Um, again, that's not to say that there weren't intermarriages and there weren't positive relationships there or trade relationships, um, but this is a, a good example of similar to the, the heads on spikes on Wayland Point. 
uh, establishing this is Squalum territory, um, and the Cowichan were very much visitors. In 1854, again, George Gibbs, part of the treaty signing party, um, talking, giving a general description of the tribes out here. Next to the Macaws are the Clallums, or as they call themselves, Squalums. Uh, they're the most formidable tribe now remaining. And the Squalum from the, the first European contact, the Squalum were actually the most numer numerous tribe on the, the interior, the uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca and the uh, Salish Sea. At the first time of contact, there were probably somewhere around two and a half to 3,000 Squalum on both sides of the strait um, and then over to, to Port Townsend and through epidemics and other factors that, that number dwindled down through the 19th century. Uh, the Squalum territory stretches along the whole south shore of the Straits between um, Port to between Port Discovery and Port Townsend, besides which they have occupied the latter place properly belonging to the Chimicum. They have eight villages, including Katai and Port Townsend. Um, and so again, basically what you're seeing was once the, the Chimicum, the number of Chimicum was so small that they could no longer uh, defend themselves, essentially, the Squalum moved in and took over that territory as well, um, which was kind of an expansion that goes back into to pre-contact era. Thomas Hanna in 1857 um, gives the number of Clallum as around 1,100, um, and that's probably not accurate. You know, depending on the time of year that they were doing these surveys, most of the Squalum would have been spread out to the wind at different fishing sites and camping sites um, from Hamahama River all the way up to the San Juan Islands and out to the Hoko River. So it was really an impossible job for any of these guys to get a real number on how many slalom there were. It didn't stop them from trying. Uh, they talk about how there were actually um, 750 slalom living on Indian Island. They were getting ready to plant potatoes and uh, through the misrepresentations of a malicious individual who through sinister motives declared to them that they would be destroyed by the Northern Indians if they remained any longer where they were. Um, basically, a, a white settler came in and said, hey, I know you guys are getting ready to plant your potatoes this year, but I just heard the Haida are coming down to raid. You better get out of here real quick. They all took off and then he built his cabin. These are just some really cool photos from the Jefferson County Historical Society. This one is um, right there uh, where the little marina is, just north of downtown now. And this is actually out there on the strait. The uh, Coast Salish canoes did not traditionally have sails. That was something that they picked up on as soon as Euro-Americans sailed in here. And they're like, hey, that looks like a really good idea. Uh, so getting into Kitai. So um, again, the the Chimicum as a socioeconomic um, unit, as a people, essentially disintegrate by the 1850s. But by 1857, we know from James Swan that there were at least 18 houses or lodges of Chimicum and 14 houses of Clallum. So um, there's probably people who are identifying as one or the other that we would now term, you know, they're all, they're all called squalum, but at that time they were still discerning between the two. Uh, this is the watercolor that I mentioned earlier, and you can see there's, there's a pretty substantial number of people here. Potlatches, you would have invited people from neighboring tribes and neighboring villages as well, so this wouldn't have been just people who lived at Katai. Um, from Gibbs' description in 1854 of the village, uh, he talks about how the houses of the chiefs at Port Townsend are of the better class, quite spacious and tolerably clean. Two or three are not less than 30 feet long by 16 or 18 feet wide. So pretty substantial homes, uh, built of heavy planks supported on large post and cross beams, and those would have all been made out of western red cedar. Uh, they were lined with mats, again made out of tule grass. Those would have lined the floor. That would have been what you slept on. Um, they would also, you can see in this image, uh, what was great about the roofs, you had these big cedar slats and they could go up there and move those on or off the roof and make openings. So you can see here they're letting in light, letting the smoke out. Then if it would start raining, you could pull your boards back over and recover the roof. Um, so longhouses were very dynamic homes and you could do um, a lot of customizing or adjusting based on what was going on at that time. Uh, 
planks forming the roof run the whole length of the building, being guttered to carry off the water and sloping to one end. There were low platforms that carried around the interior. You can see these benches that people were sleeping on or sitting on. Those doubled as the beds. They essentially you know, came out three or four feet wide from the wall. They were a foot or two off the ground. There was storage space underneath. And those would have been covered in mats, animal furs, and those dog wool blankets that I talked about earlier. So sitting in the day, sleeping in the night. Uh, piles of very neatly made baskets are stored away in the corners containing their provisions. Um, they would have had baskets, both watertight baskets and then just basic carrying baskets. They also had bent wood boxes that would have been totally airtight. And those were used to preserve food for winter months when there's not a lot to eat. Um, that was one of the reasons why you had such great cultural development amongst Pacific Northwestern tribes, despite the fact that there wasn't technically agriculture here and it wasn't an agricultural society, because the tribes here were so good at storing food and preserving food for winter, it allowed them to do all of that cultural development when other hunters and gatherers have to spend those winter months still out there scratching and scrounging for whatever food items they can find. Uh, each house had two to four fires, and each one of those hearths would have belonged to the head of a family. So you would have essentially had an extended family within a specific longhouse, you know, with all aunties, uncles, cousins, grandparents, all related within that building. Uh, they have an abundance of salmon, shellfish, and potatoes, and seem to be very well off. In 1855, uh, the Squalum, along with the Chimicum and the Tuana or the Skokomish, signed the Treaty of Point No Point, uh, in which the Squalum ceded rights to all of this land in their usual and accustomed territories. And you can see that's a pretty massive area. Uh, in return, they reserved the right to hunt, gather, and fish in their traditional um, ways and their traditional places. Uh, the treaty hypothetically was supposed to um, again give the tri reserve the right of taking fish at usual and accustomed grounds and stations erecting temporary houses for the purposes of curing together with the privilege of hunting and gathering roots and berries on open and unclaimed lands and provide the tribes with the sum of six thousand dollars in agricultural and industrial school school and tools uh, you can guess how many of those the tribes actually got out of the treaty this this many uh, the tribes agreed to free all slaves, which was a really big deal, especially for those of upper status who uh, owned a large number of slaves who um, were used to assist with salmon fishing, with gathering resources, that sort of thing, and preserving all of those materials for winter. Uh, and they also agreed to cease trading on Vancouver Island and with the Canadian slalom. So they essentially were told, no, you can't go over and visit your relatives and you can't trade with them like you've been doing for thousands and thousands of years. They still did it from time to time and they got in trouble, but um, yeah, it was, it was a tough burden. So uh, the Treaty of Point No Point was just one of many treaties that were signed out here by Isaac Stevens, who was later the first governor of Washington. At that time, he was an Indian agent. Uh, and basically what he did was scurry around as fast as he could from area to area and had the, basically conned the tribes into signing these treaties, um, went back to D.C. and said, hey, look at all of this great work I've done, and nobody ever followed through with the promises and the treaties. By 1857, a lot of tribes out here were seriously displeased with the fact that they had never received the promised monies, the schools, the implements, all of the things that they were told they were going to get in exchange for their land. So by 1857, there were a large number of tribes out here who um, wanted to go to war with the white settlers. Uh, this also occurred here in Squalum Territory. And what happened uh, around Port Townsend specifically was that, uh, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Um, in 1856, there was a group of Tlingit who actually came down from the village of Cake and they camped at Port Campbell. Uh, things got kind of rough and rowdy. Uh, the citizens, the white citizens of Port Townsend appealed to the territorial government. They sent up the steamer Massachusetts, which shelled the Tlingit. They killed a high-ranking clan leader and 30 other Tlingit. The Tlingit took, up back, took off back north. 
They came back in August of 1857 and killed Colonel Isaac Eby on Whidbey Island. Basically, tit for tat, you killed our clan leader, we're killing your military official. Um, it just so happened that in August of 1857, that was when those tensions were building with all of the other tribes around the Salish Sea as a result of the, the lack of fulfilling of those treaty promises. So this, the killing of Isaac, Easy, Isaac Eby caused this huge scare. Well, at that time, all of the tribes in this area were obviously upset. Um, so at North Beach, again to the, the northwest of Port Townsend there, uh, at the campsite, there was a large group of Squalum warriors and warriors from other regional tribes. Um, they had a, a council on how to deal with the encroaching settlers. Chetsamoka, or Chief Chichmahan, went to the council. Uh, Chichmahan actually went to San Francisco in the 1850s with James Swan. Uh, and this is something that uh, the, the white settlers would do frequently with uh, Native American chiefs was take them to a big city like San Francisco or somewhere back east to sort of awe them with white power and you know um, industrial mechanisms and all of these things that the tribes had no real concept for at that time. So Cheech Mahan had been to San Francisco uh, and, and essentially you know a lot of people try to turn the story now into Cheech Mahan was trying to save the white settlers of Port Townsend. He was not. He was trying to save his own people from the obvious repercussions that would happen if they attacked that white community. He knew that if the Squalum wiped out the white community at Port Townsend, which they easily could have done at that time, that there would have been immediate reprisals and the Squalum probably would have been wiped off the map. So he was, he was very um, forward thinking. He was ahead of his time. He counseled peace. The council wasn't hearing it. They told him to get out of there. So he basically sat out every morning on a rock there. It's also at the Port Townsend Golf Course and signaled to the white settlers in Port Townsend whether the war council was still going on or, or not. Um, and after 10, 10 days when the council decided that it wasn't worth it to go to war with the white settlers, they weren't going to come out ahead, he signaled to the settlers they could come out of the blockhouse. Um, they were safe. Um, and so that story has been very romanticized. If you now go to the Port Townsend Golf Course, you'll see this statue of Cheech Mahan in very white clothing, waving to the settlers, everything's okay. Um, but that's what really happened. Uh, in 1871, actually this is when it made it into the newspaper. It was actually passed, I believe, in, in 1869, the city of Port Townsend passed an ordinance forbidding the construction of Indian homes in Port Townsend. So this is when it becomes illegal to be an Indian in Port Townsend, is 1871. Uh, the ordinance provided that no permanent Indian houses shall be built on the beach from the Catholic Church to 150 feet west of Tyler Street, basically the, the downtown block of Port Townsend. It required the marshal to notify any Indians coming to the purposes of trade or otherwise that they were not allowed to erect their mat lodges or tents, nor build fires within the above mentioned limits. Any person violating this would be fined $20. It also provided that any white man coming to the city with Indians may apply to the marshal to obtain permission for such Indians to camp upon such vacant lot. So in order for the, the Squalum to come back to their traditional village site, they had to have a white man apply to the marshal for permission for them to do so. Um, this is a photo of the Katai Valley. So this is North Beach. This is where that war council happened uh, in 1857. This is um, an encampment where they would camp while paddling through. They would also, um, especially during the winter and really, really rough seasons, if they sat there for a couple days and they couldn't get through Admiralty Inlet, they would actually portage their canoes down here through Happy Valley, or down through the Katai Valley, down to the Katai Lagoon, which is right here, and then just paddle out into Port Townsend Bay that way. Uh, in 1867, James Swan actually wrote to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C., uh, appealing on behalf of the Squalum people and specifically his friend Cheech Mahan. The Squalum at that time and Cheech Mahan specifically in 1867 basically saw this coming and knew that sooner or later they were going to be forced off of their village site. And so what the Squalum actually tried to do, at that time it wasn't called, there wasn't an Indian island and a Marrowstone island. It was all Marrowstone island, both of those put together. 
and the Squalum through James Swan tried to appeal to the government to get that designated as their reservation, as the Squalum reservation. Um, didn't happen. What happened instead was specific Squalum families used their own money to buy land on Indian Island so that they could stay there. Uh, we have accounts from the Indian agent, Edwin Eels, again, brother to Myron Eels, the missionary, um, of the burning of the village on August 23rd, 1871. They arrived at noon on the 23rd and immediately in connection with city authorities demolished the longhouses. And then on the 24th, they burned the rubbish, saving the best of the lumber. The Duke of York, Cheech Mahan, had already started down South Hood Canal. They were gonna force them onto the Skokomish Reservation. Um, so that was part of the Treaty of 1855, um, basically said that the government was going to um, move the Squalum onto the same reservation of the Skokomish. Again, Squalum and Skokomish, that relationship goes very far back into the depths of time. There's marriage, there's economic relationships, there's also warfare. And so essentially what the, the government was saying is you need to pick up all of your things and move into your next, next door neighbor's backyard. Um, the Squalum knew that that wasn't going to fly. Most of them who even were sent down initially made it back within a few months. Uh, in August of 1871, uh, Cheech Mahan had already taken off with those Squalum who he could actually influence to leave the village. There were still people who were obstinate and refused to leave. And that says a lot for people to refuse what, what the chief is telling them they need to do. And that's that deep connection to your ancestors' land and the place that you grew up and your grandparents grew up, um, the places where your ancestors are buried. Uh, they were so very obstinate about leaving or were so very poor, they had canoe no canoes to move in. One man and his wife ran away to Port Discovery, Discovery Bay, leaving his mother canoe and most of his things which I brought with me. Another man and his, another man and his wife, Billy and Annie, were secreted by some white people just as we were starting, and I brought their things along also. So they had, they had nothing left. Annie is the washerwoman of the town, which is the only reason they wanted her to stay behind, and many good citizens were anxious that she should remain, because they don't want to do their own laundry. Uh, referring to Duke of York, Cheech Mahan, this is literally the Indian agent's account of Cheech Mahan's arrival at the Skokomish Reservation. The houses built for him by Mr. King are three small houses near the agency buildings that are entirely unfit for his use. They built three shacks and told the Squalum, those are your new homes after destroying their villages. Um, this is a photo out on Point Hudson. That was the only place that Squalum were allowed to encamp or any Native Americans were allowed to encamp after that point. Um, again, 1871, James Swan Diary talks about uh, Edwin Eels coming with a posse of his employees and pulling down the Indian houses. About 10 o'clock at night, someone set fire to the homes and burned them up, making a great light. Some apprehension was felt lest the fire spread to the town, but it burned out by 11. Um, from Marianne Lambert, who's a Jamestown Squalum ancestor, uh, and she's the granddaughter of um, Annie Jacobs, who is a Squalum woman who lived on Discovery Bay um, for almost her entire life. Her account talks about how um, in fewer than five days after being moved down to the Skokomish Reservation, every Squalum stealthily by cover of night returned to the heap of ashes, which was their Port Townsend village. Chetsamoka went to Olympia to appeal for help. That was after he saw those three shacks and said, that's not going to work for me. After a few days, he triumphantly returned, bringing a written promise assuring his tribesmen that the great white father would rectify the wrong done them by compensating the Clallams for the burning of their homes. The note, yellowed with age, was carried by his wife, Queen Victoria, until her death, fashioned to her chemise. Uh, Myron Eels, brother of Edwin Eels, that same Indian agent, in 1889, talks about how in Port Townsend, Around Port Townsend, there were still around 20 Squalum. More would live there, but the facilities for obtaining whiskey are so great that the agent has forbidden them to come there. So when you wonder why, why did they kick the Squalum out of Port Townsend, it's because Port Townsend was a big whiskey town, and they kept supplying all of the natives with liquor. It had obvious repercussions, and instead of treating the symptom or treating the cause, they, they treated the symptoms. Um, 
At that time, the Sklalem were living on Indian Island, so by that time, um, Chetsamoka, Chichmahan, and his family, his descendants are called the Prince family, they had moved over to Indian Island, along with the Butners and Chimicum Jim, they had moved over to Indian Island. Um, this gives you a little bit of insight on attitudes towards Native Americans in Port Townsend through the 20th century. This was written by Catherine McCurdy of the McCurdy family, you may have heard of them. Um, James McCurdy wrote a book about uh, the history of Port Townsend and talks a lot about his friend David Prince. This is somebody else from his family talking about um, the Indian and his point of view, which is her two and a half page story of how exciting it was for her to go down to Point Hudson and take pictures of the Indians down there, um, even though they didn't want her to take pictures of them. It never occurred to me in the early days of my camera experiences that in regard to being photographed, the Indian had a point of view. And I had to pull quotes out, but I promise you all three pages of it are even worse than the quotes that I'm reading. The Puget Sound Indian does not lend himself to high art, although he is certainly unique and interesting. Thomas Jefferson, who's a, a Squalum man, resembled a somewhat food-natured pig or perhaps a porpoise, and I suppose he never had a bath in his life. This camp had held my attention from the first. Nothing more representative of, quote, the lowest specimen of mankind could be found. These were the attitudes towards Native Americans um, up until pretty recently in Port Townsend, and this is the history that has to be acknowledged. On a happier note, <laughs> Uh, so I, I mentioned Port Hadlock earlier as the location of Tsetsibis, uh, Chimicum Village. Um, Port Hadlock was also the settlement site of Old Patsy. Uh, Old Patsy was actually a uh, Squaxin Indian, and he and his wife Jenny uh, initially lived up at a mill um, near Swinomish Island. They moved down in the, I think, 1880s to Hadlock. Their son, young Patsy, old Patsy, young Patsy, it's the original, um, married Lucy Dexter, who was the daughter of old Dexter, who's a Jamestown Squalum. So their descendants are the Patsy family from the Jamestown Squalum tribe today. Uh, he built this really big potlatch house down there at Hadlock, and in 1891 hosted um, the last big potlatch on Port, on Port Townsend Bay. Uh, what's really great about this, you can see this white roof on the potlatch house that's actually made of sailcloth. And so um, what's really unusual, potlatches typically occurred in a longhouse. The interiors of longhouses were very dark places. You couldn't really take photos, especially back in the late 1800s when cameras weren't that great. So we don't have many photos of potlatches. Because Patsy put a sailcloth on top of his potlatch house, enough light got in that we actually have photos of the potlatch occurring inside the potlatch house. Um, he moved there in 1887. He was neighbors with the Prince family and the, the Chimicum Jib, the Webster family. There was actually an article in the Port Townsend Leader newspaper at that time that said his potlatch cost him $2,000, and that's in 1891 money. Um, and uh, he saved it from his millwork to host over 500 people in a special potlatch house. Uh, so potlatches traditionally, I said earlier, you know, you would invite people from different tribes all around the Salish Sea, and you would save up money for years and years and years. This was all of the money that Patsy had. He would have saved all of that money at, up, and then he would use that money to purchase gifts and he would give all of his wealth away to, to the guests at his potlatch. And so it was potlatch is a tradition of reciprocal giving or sharing of wealth. Uh, so what would happen is um, a family, that's a way that an individual or a family would establish prestige is by sharing that wealth. And so you're sharing that wealth, you're giving those gifts to guests um, with the understanding that at some point in the future that gift giving will be reciprocated and you will be invited to a potlatch from that person and be giving a gift of you know, equal or greater value. Um, and so there were actually tribes far to the north up by Canada that through the historic period ended up actually waging potlatch wars, which was basically trying to gift the other tribe to death. Um, so, so a totally different take and you can see why our capitalist society nipped this in the bud real quick and said that's not gonna work for us and potlatches were outlawed. Um, 
uh, up through the 1970s and more recently in Canada. Like literally it was illegal for tribes to have a potlatch. They still held them, they just called them birthday parties, Christmas parties, that sort of thing. Had holiday events, um, you know, they weren't as traditional, but the traditions continued, they still continue to this day. Um, but it's just one more of those hugely important um, cultural events for the tribal peoples out here that um, were, were literally made illegal. So this is a photo looking down the length of the potlatch house and you can kind of see the benches here and some photos sitting on them. These photos are actually up at the Alaska State Library archives. Um, they've been up there for 120 years, miscatalogued as a Squaxin uh, tribe Mud Bay potlatch. Uh, but what we actually found is it's, it's in a book, this gentleman, Judge Wickersham, uh, was a, a white guy out here who was kind of writing up an account of his travels through the Pacific Northwest, and he was at the potlatch. He took the pictures, and he actually wrote an account of the potlatch. Um, so it's really great that we actually have all of this detailed information on it. Um, Patsy went around among the arrivals and distributed stores of crackers and other eatables so that every person present was supplied with food and shelter. You can see the little camping tents out here. Again, by that point, they were trading for these cotton tents um, from white traders. You can see clams on sticks smoking over the fire. Inside, this is playing slahal, the traditional gambling game that the tribes practiced out here. And then these are some of the, um, what was interesting is the potlatch actually occurred <laughs> at the same time as the Boston man's 4th of July festivities. Uh, Boston was what the natives called white people because uh, all of the first white guys that they met out here, at least Americans, the Brits were called King George's men and the Americans were called Boston men because they were all from Boston. Uh, so the Boston man's 4th of July festivities happened over in Port Townsend and then they invited the white people over to cross the bay in the dark to the camp uh, all 400 would hold a great ball in the potlatch house given by the Clallam people. It was expected to be the grandest for many years. The glory of the Clallam nation were recounted, the daring of Macaw whale hunters, of Quileute elk slayers, of Snohomish salmon catchers, and this list goes on to rattle on every tribe that's out here and a couple that I had never even heard of before. So um, it, was, it was quite the group. Um, this is Cheech Mahan's wife, Queen Victoria, same one noted earlier, keeping that note pinned to her chest until the day she died. This is her out there in Hadlock digging clams for the potlatch. This is General George Washington. So you'll notice, you know, Queen Victoria, um, Chief Chetsamoka, also called Duke of York, General George Washington. When the first um, Euro-Americans arrived out here, and specifically government officials, they wanted to conduct all of these treaty negotiations, government negotiations, um, but they couldn't pronounce any of the natives' names. So what they did was just slap titles of royalty onto them based on their status within the tribes. So Cheech Mahan was actually the Duke of York because he was the younger brother of King George or Closton, who was actually the hereditary chief um, at the time of those Indian troubles, basically at the conclusion of that council, that war council in 1857, when the tribe said, no, we're not gonna go to war with the white settlers, Closton gave up his chieftainship and disappeared forever. Um, at that point, the Duke of York or Cheech Mahan became chief of the Squalum people. General George Washington, again, one of those upper ranking sub-chiefs. So the sub-chiefs, as they're designated in the treaty signings, were basically given general designations. Um, and again, you can see a large group out here. So this is where the Port Hadlock Marina is today. Their dock kind of goes out from here. If you look south from the dock, you'll see a little lagoon. That's this lagoon where they're digging clams. Um, Old Patsy actually dug out a little path that goes through the shingle beach there. Um, and we still visit it today with the tribal youth. We call it a canoe parking lot and a canoe driveway. He basically made the Port Hadlock Marina before the Port Hadlock Marina existed. And he did it for this potlatch so that 500 people could all pull their canoes into that little lagoon. So um, more recently, you may or may not have heard uh, this past year when they went to replace the light poles at Memorial Field down there in downtown Port Townsend, um, 
we ran into, shockingly, evidence of the old village site. Uh, so these are just some photos of some of the artifacts that we found and archaeological materials we can found, which were both um, pre-contact. The, the pre-contact stuff, it, again, appears mainly to be from a seasonal um, fishing and hunting encampment, and then getting into the historic period, more year-round occupation up through, um, you know, we got to the point where there's plastic and modern refuse and debris at the top. What you're looking at here is a lot of cut um, pork and, and cow bone. And so actually where, where uh, the memorial field is down there, once the tribes were sort of pushed out of that core downtown area of Port Townsend um, and pushed onto sort of the peripheral areas around the town, basically around the, the base of the bluff and the salt marsh lagoon, which were not ideal places to live, that was also where the ethnic Chinese community lived as well. And so there were overlap between those two marginalized communities. And so we see that represented archeologically with lots of herringbone and salmon bone and the, the traditional foodstuffs that the Sklalem ate with a mix of cut pork bone um, that was probably from the Chinese community, cut beef bone, medicinal bottles, pottery, that sort of thing. Um, and we have tables and tables. We're going to end up, the, the Jamestown tribe, we're going to end up curating about 15 boxes of materials from that site. Uh, a little bit more up close, some of the lithics we found. None of them, you know, lithic uh, is another word for stone or stone tools. So lithic tools or stone tools. Um, you know, we found some, some nice sharp flakes and then basically what chunky discarded cores. What we were finding was the stuff that they didn't use. So back in the day, uh, you would find a core, you would strike that, break it off, and then use flint napping techniques to, to break that down into some sort of a blade or a point, that sort of deal. So the, the first step of that is basically testing the core that you're working on. And a lot of times you would test that, it breaks and there's faults in it, it doesn't work out, and they would discard that to the side and start working on a new one. What we found are a lot of discarded blanks or utilized flakes that have broken. So again, what we're looking at um, down here is a broken rattle. This is from, this is whalebone, and this is that Slahal gambling game. Part of the gambling game is distracting your opponents and they would use these rattles with a stick and So um, broken rattles, broken stone tools, stuff that's getting discarded off to the side of the village, off to the side of the encampment. Um, we also found some really cool uh, bone beads. That's a dime for scale, so you can tell how tiny this one is. Um, we found three all within you know, the same pile, so it, it's probably from a connected necklace. Uh, pipe bowl and stem, medicine bottles, lots of uh, historic glass, lots of unsorted metal, glass, and ceramics. Again, this is all from you know, the historic town. Uh, there were also multiple fires in historic Port Townsend, and after those fires occurred, what they would do is just push all of that material to the base of the bluff, so we were probably finding a lot of nails and burnt debris from those old fires as well. And that's my piece, so I will go ahead and take questions from the audience. Somebody's got to have questions. No questions, I'm out. All right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What was the waterproof box that they were using? So um, Bentwood, Bentwood boxes were made out of western red cedar. And what they would do is essentially you cut one long piece, and then they would kerf that down, and then steam the piece of wood and bend it. And then they would actually have little wood dowels that they would use in the corners, in one corner to bring that together. And then it's essentially a watertight box. And you can see example, examples of those on display. Um, Jefferson County Historical Society, I believe, has one on exhibit in their museum. I know the Burke has a couple. Um, we have modern representations of those. They're not actually Bentwood watertight boxes, but they look the same. And you can see those in the art gallery and stuff. That's what those are made out of. 
And those would have been used for both carrying water and then you would store food stuff. So a lot of times the way that they would store, um, say, berries, you go out in the spring and pick a ton of salmon berries, dry those out in the sun, they, you know, they become dry berries, and then they would actually mix that with seal grease, put that in the box and fill it all the way up to the top and then put a layer of grease over the top and that would essentially seal that in. And it doesn't sound appetizing to us, but different palates, different times. And you could pull that out in the middle of the winter and scoop that out and you've got a vitamin C rich, you know, calorie rich, hypothetically good tasting meal. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, not, not permanent year-round occupation because there's no fresh water source out there, but Protection Island was used for um, uh, seabird egg gathering and then seal hunting. And then uh, the prairie out there, they would have gone out there to gather the, the same prairie plants as what you saw in the other dry prairies out here. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, so for, for some tribes, yes, the Lower Elwha tribe had a, res a reservation designated for them in the 1930s, and I believe Port Gamble was in the 1950s. I might have to switch around. I don't work for them, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jamestown Squalum tribe is a different story. Uh, the Jamestown Squalum were never given a reservation. What they did was in 1871, 1874, I'm sorry, a group of uh, nine Squalum families from the Dungeness and Washington Harbor villages here pulled together $500 in gold coin and they bought 210 acres of land that had just been logged on Dungeness Bay. Um, in return, the, the guy who was logging it kept his right of way. The tribe bought that property and that was subdivided for each family by how much they contributed. And so if you look on a, a county parcel map or Google Maps today and zoom in on Jamestown, you'll still see the long, skinny, perpendicular lots. And there's, I think, 10 or 12 of them. And that was basically because each family needed beach frontage to pull up their canoe. So they built a, a traditional village there. Um, and the Jamestown Slalom uh, basically integrated with the, the Euro-American settler community at Dungeness very early on. Um, when they bought that land, Myra Neals, the missionary, he came up, um, he actually helped them sort of navigate the legalities of, of purchasing the property. Um, he helped them choose the name of Jamestown in honor of their chief at the time, James Balch or Jim Balch. He brought them up when they bought the land, he actually brought them up some plows and other agricultural implements, some apple saplings, some cherry tree saplings. Um, and the first thing the, the the Jamestown Swallow did when they purchased that property was they collectively went across the entire thing and grubbed all of the stumps and brush off of it and started planting potatoes and practicing agriculture. And so the Jamestown Swallow community existed as its own Native American community without government assistance all the way up until uh, the tribe was federally recognized in 1981. Um, the Jamestown tribe now has just over a thousand acres in reservation land and all of that land was purchased by the Jamestown tribe. And then we go through a fee to trust transfer process with the federal government in which that land is moved into trust. So all of the reservation land that the Jamestown tribe has today, they bought. Um, so interesting story there. I know I saw hands over. Because if, when the tribe buys the land, it's fee land, which means that the tribe owns the land, but the tribe still pays county taxes on it, pays taxes, all of that stuff. Once it's moved into trust, it's owned by the federal government held in trust for the tribe. The tribe doesn't pay county taxes on the land, and the tribe can also build a casino 
felt going through the county and that sort of stuff. The tribe is sovereign on reservation and trust lands. They're not sovereign on county lands, essentially. I saw a hand back here, I thought, or is that wrong? No. Way in the back. So a, a federally recognized tribe, there's, uh, I think, 560-something federally recognized tribes in the United States. In order for a Native American tribe to receive um, government assistance or government benefits, government monies, Indian health services, anything like that, they have to be a federally recognized tribe. Um, in order to become a federally recognized tribe, if you weren't kind of ushered in from the get-go, um, back in the 1970s, the federal government created this process where there's seven criteria that tribes have to meet in order to be federally recognized. Um, those criteria are very onerous on tribes because they require certain stipulations that, because of the way that tribes have been treated in this country, say for example, tribes have to prove that they have had a continual sense of community from pre-contact through the modern era. Well, from the 1850s through the 1950s, it was essentially illegal to be an Indian in America. And so you have a 100-year gap where tribes weren't re maintaining any sort of communal records because they didn't want to be known as having a community because it was turned against them. Well, now they can't prove that they were a community during that period because the documentation doesn't exist. So there's tribes like the Duwamish in Seattle that will probably I mean, sadly, but probably never get federally recognized unless that system is changed because they were so dispersed with what happened with the, the, the growth of Seattle um, that they, they can't prove those criteria, even though they still live in Seattle and they've been there for thousands of years. Um, so uh, McCall, they're, they're a federally recognized tribe. All of the tribes on the peninsula are federally recognized tribes. The closest tribe that I know of that is not federally recognized would be the Duwamish in Seattle. So being a nation, um, so how is that different or are they all considered? Tri tribe and nation are just terms used interchangeably. And so today there's three slalom tribes that are descended from the slalom people or the slalom nation. You know, at the time of first contact, you had the slalom peoples, 3,000 of them living spread out across the Strait of Juan de Fuca in Salish Sea. Now today we have the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe, the Jamestown Slalom Tribe, and the Port Gamble Slalom Tribe, who are all independently federally recognized tribes. Yes, ma'am. First of all, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sure, so um, the question is about the, the ceremonial life of the slalom. So I mentioned a little bit about the, the guys trying to take the, the government would send out these Indian agents to do a census, and they always tried to do it in the summer because the weather's nice and you can sail around from point to point. But that's when everybody's scattered out. That's when you know a village would go from being a couple hundred people, they would leave behind maybe a few dozen of the, the eldest to watch some of the youngest kids, and then all of the able-bodied persons would get on canoes, they would paddle out to the mouth of the, to creeks, rivers, good clam digging banks, all of those things would happen from spring through fall. And then around this, you know, from now until about another month from now, people would start paddling back to their winter village. So when, when I talk about villages and we talk about permanent villages, those were the winter villages. So there were permanent longhouses there year round, but the majority of the, the population of that village wasn't there until winter. And winter was the ceremonial season when all of those rites were conducted. So um, you would have potlatches in the summer, but in terms of medicinal ceremonies and those sorts of rites, those all occurred in the, in the winter time when everybody was back in the village um, together. Was the, was the pipe itself an integral to their ceremony? No, so that, that pipe is historic. 
That's yeah. Um, and so there, the tribes out here did not have access to tobacco. Um, they did smoke knick knick, dried out knick knick. Um, I'm not I'm not swallowing, and I don't know that much about you know the intricacies of the ceremonies and stuff, but. Um, I do know once tobacco was introduced by Euro Americans, then all you know all of the tribal men out here started puffing away on pipes. So that's not to say that that pipe wasn't owned by a Spalan person, but um, smoking wasn't central to ceremonial life the same way it is with like Plains tribes and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Other questions. Yeah, so there's, there's actually a couple um, up there. They're called First Nations or bands, um, Songish, Sandage. There's four of them, and I can't rattle them off right now. Um, but they all speak either Interior Salish or Squalum. It's all in, in mutually intelligible languages, same as um, Samish and Lummi speak different dialects of the same language. Lummi and Squalum, it's essentially dialectical differences of the same language. And so the Squalum are actually more closely related to the Lummi, Samish, and the tribes on the southern corner of Vancouver Island than they are related to the Lachutseed speaking tribes of Puget Sound and, and Lower Hood Canal. Yeah, we, we have um, a traditional foods project here at the tribe where they're working on, we're actually working on trying to reestablish a patch of squim prairie here in squim because that's where a lot of those important medicinal plants are found. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of tribal elders who still, you know, know that herb lore and pass it on to younger generations. Uh, I take uh, groups out every year, cedar bark gathering and plant gathering and that sort of stuff. So it, it's still a very active part of their culture. Um, and that's all done through the tribe's social and community services department. Yes, sir. Uh, could you say more about Um, it, it really depended village from village, and it depended on what family you were from and who you were, who you were related to. Um, women were definitely, you know, certain women were definitely in a place of prestige. I mentioned Annie Jacobs, who lived over on Discovery Bay. She was the daughter of the youngest daughter of Statiflum. So she was a direct descendant of the ancestral chief of the Jamestown Slum, and she was matriarch of her family but she, she wouldn't have been chief of a, a village per se. Um, it, was, it was hereditary, but it wasn't always the oldest son. Um, and we see that through um, the, the tribal oral histories and traditions that talk about um, Statiflum, the ancestral chief, he was probably alive sometime in the 1750s to 1770s. He had seven sons, it's our seven brothers restaurant at the casino. He had seven sons and a daughter. They were in that village when it got shelled by the ship in 1828. At that time, the youngest daughter was still an infant. So he was still having kids up until he was pretty old. We don't know the name of his two oldest sons. We know the name of the next six sons. It was the youngest of those, Lacanum, who became the chief after Statiflum. And then it was Lacanum's oldest son, Closton, who became the chief after him, King George. And he was chief from probably five to 10 years before he gave it up and um, Cheech Mahan became, or Duke of York became chief. Um, and so, you know, it was hereditary, but then there was the element of personal prestige and wealth that played into that. Um, you know, just because you were born to a chief, if you weren't a smart person and you didn't know how to make money and you didn't know how to conduct trade negotiations, you wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have been chief of a village. Um, there wasn't, they didn't get together and, and have an election. It was just kind of by common consensus on this person is gonna speak for us all collectively, 
But if any of us want to raise a concern, we can stop this right here and now. So um, it's, it's tough to use the term chief, which was tacked on there once your Americans arrive into the, the cultural structure of the squalum, which was to say that there were high-ranking families of wealth and prestige that generally controlled what went on in the village because they owned rights to a fish trap on the Dungeness River, which is the Dungeness Chiefs, that was their wealth. Um, the chief of the Washington Harbor Village where at the entrance to Squim Bay, he owned the rights to the fish trap on Jimmy Come Lately Creek here at the head of Squim Bay. And those rights were passed to him by his father. So the father and his wisdom would pass on those rights to which of his issue he saw fit to pass it along. So that's a very long, convoluted answer to your question. It's probably the best I can do. That's on the other hand. Yes, sir. Uh, there are two related cultural questions. One of them is uh, the what happened with slaves. Uh, did slaves become part of the tribe of Nancy? Were they first slaves worked to death in the marriage? Or what was it? And the related question is how was marriage handled? Um, so slavery, uh, again, depends on um, what village you're talking about and who is there. Um, the Washington Harbor Village, you know, we have accounts of the elders talking about how in the, the 1850s, there were essentially two villages. There was the palisaded Squalum Village. And then out from that, at the end of the spit, was a bunch of shacks, and that was the slave village. And that, that was done intentionally, leaving them more exposed to attack. So if there was a slave raid from one of those northern Canadian tribes, the brunt of that attack fell on the slave village and gave the Swalom time to respond. We know that, I mean, literally the, the elders and their accounts from that village say that by the 1860s, those two separate communities had totally integrated and there is no separation between the two. Within the tribe itself, they would have known genealogies and knew who's descended from slaves and who wasn't. But when you look at the impacts of, at that village in 1871, there was a smallpox epidemic that wiped out probably three quarters of the village population. And there would have been epidemics before that. It's really hard to maintain that sort of social hierarchy when suddenly 80% of the population is gone. Um, you go from a, a village of 400 people to 40, you know, it's really hard to say you're a slave and I'm not when you're essentially in, in even numbers. Um, there are accounts in, in other villages the slaves were killed. Um, in terms of marriage, uh, it, it depends on the status of your family. If you were wealthy or of high status, um, if you were a woman, you were you were probably married into another family of high status at another tribe, you know, Macaw, um, Skokomish, other side of the sound. Um, if you were a man, you kind of, there were more options. You could go out and find a wife or you could have a marriage arranged for you by your parents. Um, for commoners, it was, it was a bit less structured, a bit less rigid, basically. Um, it depended a lot on your family, but there was a lot of leeway with the exception of you couldn't marry a slave. Um, and they, they kept track of those bloodlines going back pretty far. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much for coming out tonight.